are um, Praise the Lord. Uh, we are uh, continuing in our Christian life class on the subject of things Christians need to know. Things Christians need to know. And we are dealing initially with doctrine. And so we're talking. We, have, we talked last time about the doctrine of the oneness of God, and we're going to continue in that, albeit we're going to uh, do something I think needs to be done, and we're talking about the doctrine of the oneness of God versus, versus the doctrine of the Trinity. And anytime you teach the doctrine of the oneness of God, uh, then automatically it's, it's versus the doctrine of the Trinity or Triunity, uh, supposedly of God. So, but we're going to really talk about this and um, and go through it and uh, talk about the origin and the source of the doctrine of the Trinity and things of that nature. Now, quickly, very very quickly, to to give us a little bit of a of a refresher, but then also a heads up on the doctrine of the oneness of God. Amen. The key scripture. For all Judaism is Deuteronomy 6.4. And it is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, amen, is one Lord. Or in the Masoretic, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And um, this is the first and greatest commandment. Jesus said this is the first and greatest commandment. And and I, I know I don't do it justice, but in the Hebrew, Shema, O Israel, Adonai, Aleheinu, Adonai, Echud. And that phraseology has gone from the lips of many, multiple thousands upon thousands of Jews that have been slain. And their last words were Shema, Yo Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It is a strictly monotheistic doctrine. Strict monotheistic in the true sense of the word. And that is entirely scriptural. <clears throat> David, in Second Samuel 7.22, stated, Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. The God of the Old Testament was a God that there was no God beside him. He was there all by himself. He broke it down finer in Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. Ye are my witnesses, speaking to the children of Israel, saith the Lord. <clears throat> I do want to repeat this again, that in the Old Testament, whenever you see the word Lord in all capital letters, all capital letters, that is what is referred to, again, as the Tetragrammaton, and that is the King James Version translator's rendering of the word Jehovah. And again, there's other ways. Nobody knows exactly how to pronounce Jehovah. Yahweh, Yahweh, Jehovah. Nobody knows for sure. But a few times in the Old Testament, they did translate it Jehovah. But uh, the rest of the times, all capital letters, L-O-R-D, is the Hebrew word spelling rendition of Jehovah. So, ye are my witnesses, saith the Jehovah, and my servant, speaking of Israel, whom I have chosen, he chose them, that the reason he chose them was that ye, they may know and believe me and understand that I am he. It doesn't get any more singular than that. I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. There's no God formed before me. There's not going to be another God formed after me. Then he breaks it down finer. He says, I, a singular I, even I am the Jehovah. I am the Lord. And beside me, there is no Savior. Beside me, there is no Savior. He's it. There's no Savior next to him. Amen. There's no Savior beside Him. 
Then in 1 Timothy 1.17, the God of the New Testament, the God of the New Testament, Paul writing to his son in the Gospel, states, Now unto the King, not kings, plural, King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And then the writer Jude in the 25th verse of Jude, to the only wise God, our Savior. So there is only one wise God, and to Him be honor and glory forever. Jude said, there is only one wise God, our Savior. He is our Savior. And be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. So what Paul is talking to Timothy and us about in 1 Timothy 1.17, Jude is talking to us about the only wise God is our Savior. The only wise God told the Hebrews, I, even I am the Lord, beside me there is no Savior. This is why the name Jesus means Jehovah Savior. Jehovah has become Savior. He did not send another. He became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, Jesus Christ of the New Testament is Jehovah of the Old Testament. They are one and the same. They are one and the same. The difference in the New Testament is that Jehovah God is manifest in the flesh. That's the only difference. And the Apostle Paul affirms this. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was raised at the feet of Gamaliel. This man knew the doctrine of one God. Believe me, he could pronounce Shema Yo Israel correctly. And, uh, but in his defense to the Jews in the temple, in Acts 24, 14, he tells them, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy. Now he was a worshiper of Jesus Christ. And he was believed by the Jews to be a heretic for worshiping in Jesus Christ as God. He said, I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. When I am worshiping Jesus Christ of the New Testament... I am worshiping Jehovah God of the Old Testament. I am worshiping Moses God. I am worshiping Isaiah's God. I am worshiping David's God. I am worshiping the God of my fathers, believing all things which were written, which are written in the law and in the prophets. He said, so I believe everything they wrote and I'm worshiping the God that they worshiped. So when you're worshiping Jesus Christ of the New Testament, you are worshiping Jehovah God of the Old Testament. Not a second person, not an emissary. It's Him manifest in the flesh. Now, we're going to go back and we're going to give you the doctrine of the Trinity. It is also referred to as the Athanasian Creed and it is also referred to as the Nicene Creed. Uh, the reason, um, even for the various names, is is acts technically, technically, the doctrine of the Trinity as is read today, and is accepted by quote unquote Christendom, in the Athanasian Creed is really it's quite a development. Began with the Nicene Creed of 325 A.D., and then about 80 years uh, later, um, there was the Cappadocian Creed. And that came out of Cappadocia. And, uh, and then the Athanasian Creed as it is today is a development that took place about the 5th century um, uh, A.D. And so, uh, but I'm going to give it to you. You look it up. This is what you're going to find. And there's, I think, I think there's 35 points. Now, this is the official Athanasian Creed. Whosoever will be saved, point number one, before all things it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. Number two, which faith except everyone do keep whole 
and undefiled without doubt, he shall perish everlastingly. Number three, and the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity. Number four, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance, although we're already confounded, but that's fine, nor dividing the substance, for there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Spirit, i.e., there are three persons. Father, Son, Holy Ghost are three persons, uh, yet neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. Number six, but the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Co-eternal, meaning that sonship is an eternal situation. It's, it was always, always there as a separate person, and the Holy Spirit was always there as a separate person. Uh, the majesty co-eternal number seven such as the father is such is the son and such is the holy spirit eight the father uncreated the son uncreated and the holy spirit uncreated Uh, number nine the father incomprehensible the son incomprehensible the holy spirit incomprehensible number ten the father eternal the Son eternal, and the Holy Spirit eternal. Now, if you ever walk someone through this, that state that they believe in a Trinitarian doctrine, and, uh, and so you take them to the Trinitarian doctrine, you'd be shocked how many say, I don't believe that. Oh, no. What meaneth this, Larry? Huh? Don't send. My computer's been acting funny, and I need you or your brother to check it out. All right? All right? So, uh, anyway, if you'll show this to someone that says they believe the doctrine of Trinity, as you begin walking them through it, they're going to say, I, I don't believe that. Uh, I've, I've never personally see anybody say I I I really believe that that's what I believe uh, they say they believe the doctrine of the Trinity well this is it brother and and and, and the, in the Athanasian Creed he says they say you don't believe this you're not saved so pay attention all right number 11 and yet there are not three eternals but one uncreated and one incomprehensible or non-understandable all right, number 12, so likewise the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, the Holy Spirit almighty, and yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. Now this guy should have run for president, amen. <laughs> Sorry, it's too good to pass, praise God. All right, or, or worked on the monetary bill, whatever Okay, so then number 14. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So likewise, the Father is Lord, the Son Lord, the Holy Spirit Lord. So we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to say there are three gods or three lords. Even though they just said it. Number 18, the Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, none is a four or after another, none is greater or less than another. 22, but the whole three persons are co-eternal and co-equal. Three persons, co-eternal and co-equal. 23, so that in all things, as aforesaid, the unity in Trinity 
and the Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. 24, he therefore that will be saved must thus think of the Trinity. But don't think too long or you'll go crazy. And that is, that is from their own statements. Their own statements. Their own statements. That, uh, I've, I, and, I, and I've got it and I'm going to be including this in the lesson, not today. Of statements of people that believe the Trinity that basically said it is impossible to understand. And, 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 and one uh, of their leaders said, if you study it too much, you will go crazy. So, here we go. Number 25. Furthermore, it is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe rightly in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. 26. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man. By that, God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the worlds, and man of the substance of his mother, born in the world, perfect God and perfect man of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting. Meaning, what this means is that the three persons of the Godhead, the Son, became Son. The Son took on flesh and became Son. Okay, so he was a pre-existing sonship and then became real son of human flesh. Okay, then 29, equal to the father as touching his Godhead and inferior to the father as touching his manhood. 30, who although he is God and man, yet he is not two, but one Christ. 31, one not by conversion of the Godhead into flesh, but by taking of the manhood into God. 32. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. 33. For as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead, 35, he ascended into heaven, sitteth on the right hand of the Father, God Almighty. 36, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. 37, at, though, at whose coming all men shall rise again with their bodies. 38, and shall give account of their own works. 39, and they that have done good shall go into everlasting life. They that have done evil into everlasting fire. 40, this is the Catholic faith, which except a man believe faithfully, he cannot be saved. So, there you have it. If anybody ever tells you what we believe and teach is confusing, you take them to this. You take them right here. And you say, which is easier? Okay. All right. Which is easier. Now, does it make a difference? Amen. What we teach, what that is, and then we're going to deal with uh, the Nicene Council, a man named Arius, what he taught. Does it even make a difference? There are some today, there are some today that want to tell us that it's just a matter of semantics. And that it really doesn't matter. Listen to me now. There are some people of our persuasion that are starting to talk the lingo of it's nothing but semantics. I'm here to tell you it is not semantics. It is not semantics. Okay? Isaiah 8 and 20 lets us know it is not semantics. Isaiah 8 and 20 states this. To the law and to the testimony... If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Whatever is spoken, if it's not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. And then in John 8, 24, Jesus said, I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins, 
For if you believe not that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. Jesus said, you've got to believe that I am He, or you're going to die in your sins. In verse 27, He explains, they understood not that He spake to them of the Father. This is why Jesus said in John 14, To Philip and the disciples, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And for the umpteenth time, but I'm just getting started, if the Lord tarries. Here's the picture. Alright? God is a spirit. God is a spirit. The spirit does not have flesh and bones. There is only one spirit. God is that spirit. He could not die. He tempts no man, neither indeed can he be tempted, and has no blood to shed. This God, as creator of everything and everybody, had to save us himself. He said, I, even I am the Lord, beside me there is no Savior. So his spirit overshadowed the Virgin Mary. And in her womb, a son is born. A son is given, a child, a son is born, a child is created, and from her womb came forth a son. God, who could not bleed, be tempted, suffer, nor die, through Mary's womb became flesh. And through the body, he could taste death. Through the body, he could be in all points tempted. Through the body, he could shed the only innocent blood. It was not the first person of the Father and the third person of the Holy Ghost looking at the second person of the Son and the three of them deciding who should pay the price and therefore the Son go. No, no, it's one Almighty God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He's all by himself. And he did not send another. He robed himself in human flesh and felt the blow himself. Felt the blow himself. Amen. Now, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to, to stop along the way here. And through this series, there's uh, some things I want to demonstrate to you. Come here, Bubba. Okay. Now, Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, if we're here, and somebody were to throw a hand grenade between me and Brother Moses and Carmelo, and let's say this boy is my son, and we're coexistent, co-eternal, and, uh, and the hand grenade's there, and then there's another person over here of the Holy Spirit. And uh, somebody's got to pay this price. So I look at the Son. He looks at me. We look at the Holy Spirit. We look back to the Son. And jump on the ground. And we put him on the ground. And boom! He suffers the blow. Lay, lay there. Because you, you're, you're not in good shape. And, and he's there. And, and me and the Holy Spirit look at each other and say, that was very dear to me. And, and I really liked him. And that was, that was hard to do. It's hard to do. So I'm going to raise him up. Now, there's something quite not right about that. It, don't, it doesn't jive. But how about this? Here's the hand grenade. And and here's Moses and Carmelo. And it's ticking. And I can't bleed. I can't suffer. I can't die. But I robe myself in human flesh. And every temptation and every trial I feel. Every tear. Every trauma. Every pain. And when they've nailed me to the tree in my hands. And my visage is marred more than any other. And I'm feeling every single bit of it. When 
an individual dies, what happens? The spirit leaves the body. And as the spirit is leaving the body, that man, that man, had to be made a man. Because the first man, Adam, lost it through disobedience. The second man had to win it back through obedience. As God, robed in human flesh, feels it all, tastes it all, drinks it all. Amen. As the Spirit starts to leave the body, He says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Spirit leaves. A dead body is laid in a tomb. Spiritless, lifeless. The same Almighty God, Almighty Spirit, re-enters into that body, glorifies it, magnifies it, and is sitting on the throne. That is our doctrine. Amen. And so, how did all of this come about? Jesus said, um, they understood not that he's speaking to them in the Father. You must believe, he said, that I am he. Now, this is how all of this came about. We know it's not what the apostles taught. When, when Simon, uh, when the apostle... Uh, Paul said, So worship I the God of my fathers. Okay. Getting the clock just right here. Uh, what took place in the, the formation of the Trinitarian dogma, ye drama, it began, give or take, 320 A.D. Now, it actually started before then. But by 320 A.D., uh, quote unquote Christendom that was claimed to be Christian was in a great foment now this is uh, roughly not quite but almost three centuries after the advent of the church and uh, it is in the third century and the beautiful doctrine of the oneness of God through carelessness on people's parts had begun to become leery. Not with all of them. Not with all of them. I have a friend of mine, and Joel and I went through Istanbul uh, with Brother Scotty and Brother Sister Baus. Uh, two, two years? Three? Four. I really am going to show you those pictures. I'm so sorry. I really am. And anyway, but uh, a friend of mine was standing outside of the oldest church in uh, Istanbul, Constantinople, in the, in the days of old, named after Constantine, the emperor who headed up this Nicene Council. And when, and, and a guide that was there told him, said, now in this courtyard, the proclamation... 325, 85 years from here, was read about the uh, Athanasian Creed giving the dogma of the persons of God. And, and there was a group of Christians that refused that doctrine. They said, we do not believe that. Nor do we believe what Arius has been stating. And those people were slain in that courtyard. They were killed. They refused to believe the Athanasian Creed. And they refused to believe what Arius believed. And that pretty much leaves us. Amen. And they were slain in that oldest uh, church courtyard there in Istanbul. Today Istanbul. Well, by 320 A.D., there was a great foment. Part of it came from a man by the name of Arius, who was a presbyter of the city of Alexandria. And uh, he was quite a character. Uh, He was very, very, uh, history says, very good looking. He was very eloquent. And uh, he had a good command of Scripture. He didn't have a good understanding of Scripture, but he had a good command of it. And uh, he was teaching 
basically that Jesus, if he was indeed a man, could not be God. Okay? Then, uh, that, his doctrine, and by the way, I'm going to back up here. His, uh, his doctrine, and he was, he was, he was quite a, uh, he was a pretty smooth guy, and he would, he would put his doctrine in songs. In songs, little ditties that would stick in your mind. And so there were people all over Asia and, and anywhere where Christendom was that were singing these little songs spouting Arius' doctrine. And, and he, was, he, was, he was a sharp guy. Well, and then he wrote a letter, treatise as it was, to uh, the chief bishop by the name of Alexander uh, of that whole uh, region and um, of, the, of the church. Now, a very important thing took place in 312 A.D. Constantine, who was the Roman emperor, he, he declared that from this day forward, the Roman Empire is Christian. Now, you've got to understand, that's a big deal. That's a big, big, big deal. It would be like there being so many quote-unquote Christians in Mecca and in Saudi Arabia for them to get up and say from this day forward, because there's so many Christians, Saudi Arabia is a Christian nation. Now that's pretty hard to fathom, but that's what happened in Rome. And when Constantine did that, then all of a sudden... All of those that were persecuting Christians and hated Christians, etc., etc., they found out we are in a Christian nation. And some people look at this as a great, great victory, but most church historians of any merit say this is not a victory. It would be like me somehow being mayor of, of uh, uh, you know, they have weak mayors and strong mayors. I don't know if you know that in cities. And a strong mayor is a mayor that doesn't deal with counsel. A strong mayor, he runs, he or she runs everything. That is a strong mayor. Fresno uh, voted in several years ago a strong mayor to fight the gangs. And the mayor was tough. And they brought in SWAT teams and everybody else. And they chased the gangs into the smaller towns round about. Be that as it may. The smaller towns didn't appreciate it. But there we go. But, but if I was strong mayor of Rialto, and I was to declare, from this day henceforth forward, everybody in Rialto is a Christian. And the guy that's out there stealing your hubcaps will be very comforted to know that. Okay? And the guy that's making the drug deal would say, don't cheat me now because I'm a Christian. It was like that in Rome. All of a sudden everybody's Christian, though they really were not. I can, I can, I can tell you that I'm a St. Bernard. And if I don't drool on you like one, and lick your face like one, and eat like one, uh, all the time, <laughs> then, then I am not, I am not a St. Bernard, even though I could call myself a St. Bernard. So, anyway, everybody was Christian now. And that meant, if everybody was Christian, the first thing to take the major blow was this. Because this declares what is Christian and what is not. And if everybody's Christian, you have to take this and set it aside. You have to. So at any rate, they were, some were trying to cling to this, some, some were not. Some cared, some didn't. Some didn't understand it at all, but there they were. So there's a lot of confusion there. So the bishop of Alexander, and he had an assistant by the name of Athanasius. And they did not believe the doctrine that Arius was propounding. Amen. But they did not, obviously, have the revelation of the one true God and the understanding of what happened at the incarnation and who Jesus really was. So without the revelation, they're trying to fight Arius' doctrine with human reasoning. Hence what they came up with. Another key player, of course, is Constantine, the emperor of Rome. And the reason that people didn't just keep singing their ditties and Arius would keep saying what he had to say and Alexandria... Alexander and Athanasius contesting it was because the Roman Empire was such in such foment over the person of Jesus and who he was or was not that 
Constantine saw his political realm at stake, and so he convened a, uh, uh, a gathering of all of the bishops, all of the pastors, to a place called Nicaea, modern-day Turkey. And there they were to hash out this matter, and so Constantine was breathing down their neck. You get this issue settled and I mean now. And he did show up a little bit for it. He could not speak anything but Latin. He knew no Greek. The entire deal was going on in Greek. Constantine had no understanding of theological matters whatsoever. And so so here it was. And, and so they were forced to get this issue settled. Now here is the doctrine that Arius propounded. Amen. And that he was he was declaring. Arius's doctrine. Now, and you have to understand, there's some things that he's stating that are worth considering. But he didn't have the revelation. And so he handled them his way. And then Arius, I mean Alexander and Athanasius without revelation, they refuted Arius's doctrine in their way. All right, Arius's doctrine was basically this. The only true divine is God the Creator. That's the only true divine that is God the Creator. And I buy that. I have no problem with that. The Creator is the one true God. Okay? So he believed that. Therefore, as Jesus, Arius said, was a man... And we know he was indeed a man. He could not be God in the truest sense of the word. If Jesus was a man, he could not be God in the truest sense of the word. This is Arius' doctrine. He was created, therefore fragile and finite. Fragile and finite as he, the man Christ Jesus, was created. Okay? This doctrine is alive and well today. It is known as the Jehovah Witness Doctrine. That is the Jehovah Witness Doctrine. This is the reason that, okay, in the King James, John 1 and 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now, we know that there is but one Creator. Okay? And Revelation will give you this understanding. God is a Spirit. Now, I do this I do this sometimes. When I do this today, I don't want you to go to sleep on me. Alright? I don't want to lose you here. But everybody, close your eyes. Don't lose me now. Stick with me. Keep listening to my voice. Let's just for a moment pretend... That you're God. Now, that may be easier for some than others. I don't know. But, just pretend that you're God. There's no height, no depth, no length, no breadth. There's no angels. There's there's nothing. There's only you. There's just you. There is just you. Okay? And so you're God. And you want to begin creating. Let's do it with... John 1 and 1, or uh, Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, let there, verse 2, God said, let there be light. So here we are. You're, you're God. There's nothing. Everybody say, let there be light. Open your eyes. Please. And there's light. There's light. Now I'm going to ask you a question. What came first? The light or the word? Let there be light. And there was light. Now, the Word, let there be light, was not another God. It was not a second person or a third. It was you expressing yourself. In the beginning, now before there was any creation, was the Logos, Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You can't separate your Word from you. That'd be like, that'd be like me 
telling Adam, I'm going to do something for him. And then if I don't do it, I would say, well, that wasn't me. That was my word. Do what? You know, that, you, you're going to have to take that up with the word, man. That, that wasn't me. Here's me. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All that was was God expressing Himself. Let there be light. And there was light. So it was God expressing Himself. So this is why we know in John 1 and 10, Jesus, amen, was in the world, and the world was made by Him. Because verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The expression became flesh. It wasn't a second person became flesh. It was God became flesh and dwelt among us. But Arius did not have this, this understanding. And he said there's only one supreme creator. Jesus was a man, therefore he could not be supreme creator. This is the doctrine of the Jehovah Witnesses. This is why in the New World Translation Bible, I'm not being ugly, but it's, it's the way it is, The New World Translation reads like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. And the Word was a God. That's how they get around it. He's not God, he was a God. And and so that is Arius' doctrine. That is Arius' doctrine. He was propounding that, that Jesus was a man. He was very special. And, and he, was, he was a God, but he was not the mighty, almighty God. Well, he was almighty God, simply manifest in the flesh. He became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, now, so now Athanasius, they know that that's not right. There's too many other scriptures that declare that Jesus Christ is the Almighty. And so they, they want to refute that. But again, they're striving to do so, and they do not have revelation. And so they're trying to fight it. So this was what they said. Only he who had created the world could save it. I agree. Only the creator of the world that was now lost could Save it. All right? The Son, therefore, had to be divine and had to possess the same nature as the Father. They, they had it separated in their mind. They couldn't, well, anyway. So they, they, they knew the Son had to be uh, God, so He was of the same nature. The word literally is hermusa. And it means of the same stuff, actually. Uh, the Son and the Holy Ghost were therefore a uh, separate entities, but of the same substance, Uisa, as the Father. So the Son and the Father, and, and if you want to get technical, we can get history, it is so technical that it can drive you crazy, is that uh, basically in the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., they didn't really know what to do with the Holy Ghost. They were mainly dealing with the relationship of the Father to the Son. And, and, and then they re- remembered about the Holy Ghost, and they kind of just threw him in there. And so it was 80 years later at the Cappadocian Creed that they really incorporated more of the Holy Ghost in it. And then, of course, the final Athanasian Creed is, uh, is where they, 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 they get it. It was quite a development. Let me tell you something. The, the oneness of God is a development in the mind of God, in the way of God, in who He was, and He just gave it to us. Boom! It didn't take men hundreds and hundreds of years to figure it out. He just gave it, and that's the way it was. So, they're stating that they're separate entities, but even though they're separate entities, they're separate persons, they're made out of the same stuff. That way there's three, but not one. So, this doctrine is alive and well today, and it's called the doctrine of the Trinity. So, what you have is basically Jehovah Witness doctrine, which is incorrect, trying to be corrected without revelation and coming up with doctrine of the Trinity. This is how it was really born. And it goes deeper than that, but you can only... So you got to start somewhere. Now, uh, though... This is historical and it's interesting. Though the Athanasius Creed 
was accepted. What Athanasius had to say was accepted. It was voted on, and uh, uh, Arius voted no, and two other guys, a couple other guys refused to vote. It's believed that possibly they were, they had the revelation of the one as they, but anyway. Uh, the Athanasius Creed was accepted. The controversy continued fiercely for another 60 more years, very fiercely, and beyond, down through the centuries. There was still fierce, and here we are today, the Jehovah Witness doc, Doctrine of the Trinity. But it was a fierce controversy. And it wasn't settled. Athanasius himself, before it was over, would be exiled five times, during which time Arius was back in favor. So the Roman government, starting with Constantine, amen, uh, in this issue, he would be so confused. After a while, Athanasius, you're out, and Arius, you're in. So then everybody had to go with Arius. And then after a while, his group, Athanasius' group, would get stronger. Okay, Arius, you're out, and Athanasius is back. I mean, it was a royal mess, a royal mess uh, during those times. Constantine had no idea theologically what was even going on. He's like, he was with New World every day. But this is very important. All of this hurrah going on between Arius and Athanasius' lack of revelatory doctrine totally alienated the Jews to this day. In the formulation of the doctrine of the Trinity, the Jews cannot accept it. They cannot buy into it. And listen to me closely. This is very important too. That this doctrine of the Trinity created very fertile ground for Muhammad's strict, but at least it was sensible in its monotheistic flavor of his monotheism. One of the reasons that, that Islam, aside from the fact that, that, yes, they did use the sword and they did conquer by the sword, was that his sword cut through all of this stuff and said, there is but one Allah. Allah Akbar! God is great. And there's just one of him. And that makes sense. Even a farm boy out there will look up tell you there's one God. There's something about nature itself declares even his eternal power and Godhead. And so the, as it were, through all the fierce bickering, uh, embracing of the doctrine of the Trinity, it became very repulsive to the Jews to say that God is three persons. And I mean, it just, and, and, and I know that Christendom says, we are a monotheistic faith, we believe in one God. It's kind of like with our fingers crossed, you know. But there's really three. And, and, and to the Jews, they can't go that. And the Muslims cannot go that. The doctrine of the Trinity is a joke to Orthodox, uh, true, monotheistic believing Jews and Muslims. It's a joke. It's a laughing stock. This is why if I'm talking to a Muslim or I'm talking to a Jew, I let them know I am strict monotheistic there is no trinity hear O israel the lord our god the lord is one not two not three amen and let's see i'm just about okay so that was the breeding ground for that now this is what we are going to be doing musicians go ahead and come we are going to work our way through not every statement of the Athanasius Creed. We're not going to do that. But we are going to go through it slowly and scripturally. There is a scriptural answer for the doctrine of the Trinity. A scriptural answer. Such as, for there is, number five of the Athanasian Creed, there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's that statement. Let's all stand. This is the subjects we are working on. I'll give you this answer right away. Number one, A, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. Anywhere, any place, any form whatsoever, it is not found in the Bible. Amen. B, Isaiah 43, 11, the answer to that, I, even I, am the Lord. Beside me, there is no Savior. And then Isaiah 44 and 8, is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God 
I know not any. The person of the Father did not know a person of the Son or of the Holy Spirit. And let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. I even I am the Lord, Jehovah, beside me there is no Savior. Jehovah's speaking. There's no Savior next to Him. And says, is there a God beside me? I know not any. In the doctrine of the Trinity, who's talking here? Who could possibly, in the doctrine of the Trinity, who could possibly be talking to pronounce these Scriptures if there are three persons? Who could be? If you say, well, all three were talking, then it would be like saying it and going, 